I think today I want to talk about something that's one of my more favorite passages. My wife just makes a lot of fun of me because I say, oh, my favorite passage, you know. I say that about all kinds of passages. But this one's a fun one. It's from um, 2 Kings. Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, at such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to that place, about which the man of God told him. And thus he used to warn the king of Israel so that he saved him more than once or twice. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called the servants and said, Will you not show me Who of you is for the king of Israel? And one of the servants said, None, my lord. But Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, Go and see where he is that I can send and seize him. And he's told he's in Dotham. So he sent three, let's see, he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Elisha said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, open the eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young servant And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around. And and when the Syrians came down, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike the people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, according to the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said, Hey, you're going the wrong way. Follow me. I'll bring you to the man you want to seek. And led them all the way to the king of Israel. And then the king of Israel says, What should I do? And he says... Should I, should I kill them? He says, no, let's have a feast for them and send them on their way. And that's how the story goes. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So we need more men like Elijah and Elisha. Well, it's a pretty radical moment in the Bible, yeah? Um, I mean, really, there are few people like Elisha the prophet. You might recall he's the guy who was following Elijah, and Elijah did all these radical s- miracles. And so Elisha says, Can I have a double portion? And so he does exactly twice as many miracles. Okay? And so Elisha is a miracle man. And you might recall Elijah went to heaven in a fiery chariot. Okay? And when his mantle fell off of him, that's what Elisha put around him and talk about a nice coat to have. And, you know, there's lots of fun miracles that Elisha does. Um, one time a bunch of teenagers said, go up, bald head, go up. Okay, and so Elisha was irritated about somebody making fun of his bald head. I can relate, okay? <laughs> And two bears came out and roughed up the young men, actually tore them apart. And um, that was kind of a unique situation. A lot of people say, why was he so sensitive about his bald head? The young men were coming and attacking his mentor, Elijah, who went up in a chariot of fire. Okay, so it wasn't so much a personal attack. They were attacking the God of Israel, and that's why he had that kind of reaction. Okay, it was not willy-nilly, hey, let's have a couple of bears kill 42 kids. It was not like that. Uh, one time, an axe head is at the bottom of the, pan, the pond, and, and Elijah has the axe head come up from the bottom of the pond. One time, somebody was dead, and he raised him from the dead. When Elisha was dead, they put somebody else in his coffin, and the dead man came alive. Which is kind of fun because the miracles that Elijah did happened even after 
he was dead. Okay? And, and here we have a situation that has to do with vision, seeing things. Okay? Um, Elisha's servant had a vision of the problem. We're surrounded by the enemy. And he didn't see the greater hosts of God's angels who were around them. He saw the danger, but he didn't see the deliverance. And this is very important for all of us to think about. Because we all see the danger. We all see the problems. We all got issues, right? And, and so basically what happens is he needed spiritual spectacles or godly glasses, which is what I'm hoping you are going to put on when this message is over. And you'll be challenged in a positive way to see everything from the right perspective. So the disciples one time, they said, why do you teach him parables? And Jesus said, because those seeing, they do not see. And they will see but not perceive. And you're like, well, why doesn't God want everybody to see the truth? Okay, why would there be a, a fog over their eyes? Well, because you have to understand something. Jesus is not selling eternal fire insurance. He's inviting people into a relationship with God. And if you knew, if I accept this deal, then I'm not going to go to hell. I mean, and it's a no-brainer, right? Oh, I want that deal. Who's not going to take that deal? But Jesus is not after making sure that you make the right eternal decision. He's inviting you into a personal friendship with God. Okay, two different things here. All right? I want you to understand that. And, and so... A lot of people, they just don't see what's available. Christianity is not about going to heaven and seeing my loved ones. I think that's a perk. But heaven's about you going to experience the ongoing presence of God forever and ever. Amen. Okay? And, and you know, Helen Keller, okay, she was deaf, dumb, and blind. And this is what she said. I've walked with people whose eyes are full of light and see nothing. They see nothing in the woods or sky. Their soul's voyage through this enchanted world is a barren wasteland. And, and it's easy to live an empty existence. It's easy to see the half uh, full glass rather than the, you know, what, what it really is. It's half empty rather than half full is what I meant to say. We see what we're missing rather than what God's already provided for us, what God's made available to us. And it seems like when you focus on the half full, it fills up more. When you focus on the empty glass, it seems to deplete even more, half empty glass. And, and so today, I want the vision of your faith to get the right perception of who God is. They say that uh, seeing is believing. In Christianity, believing is seeing. Okay? When you believe, you'll see. I'll believe it when I see it. Okay? Well, you'll see it when you believe it is the real way. So, you got two sets of eyes. You got physical eyes, you've got spiritual eyes. There's a, a, a fish in South America. It's called four eyes, okay? And it has these radical eyes that see above the, the, the water line and below the water line. And this is the kind of eyesight we're supposed to have. We see what's around us in the natural world, and we see the heavenly world that's available to us. If you're only looking down here, you're going to miss what God's made available to you. He's got ready for you, okay? We need to have the kind of eyes that... that uh, we're aware of the snares of the evil one in this world. And the way to do that is to keep our eyes on Jesus. Okay? The author and perfecter of our faith. This is Hebrews 12. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Or how about the great hymn? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. And the things on this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Okay? So, turn your eyes on Jesus. Look into his face. That's where you and I get empowered. You know, this one New York ophthal ophthalmologist, he said that people in New York City are more nearsighted than anywhere else in the, in the world because they grew up surrounded by skyscrapers. 
And so their concept of distance <laughs> is a lot different than, okay? I don't know if it's true or not. He's probably just trying to, you know, improve his practice and get more glasses sold, but nevertheless. I think sometimes, though, you know, we, we focus on, again, our problems, and we forget the problem solver. I want you to see who's available to you. Now, I like the way God uses Elisha to keep the king of Israel safe from attacks. What you have to understand is the king of Israel doesn't follow God. I don't know if he believes in God. This guy is a secular guy worshiping secular gods, but God loves his people, and God's committed to Israel, even though Israel is no longer following him. And he tries to entice the king of Israel by saying, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to have every time your enemy tries to come against you, I'm going to make sure Elisha tells you about it. And so you would think after time and time again, you would go, maybe I should pay attention to this God. But he doesn't. You know, I have a friend who, um, they were in a serious sickness in the hospital, and they said, I saw Jesus come and heal me. Didn't move them to follow Jesus. I went to their house one time, and they said, I have this ear problem. And so I go, well, can I pray over you? And I'm going to the hospital for, to have surgery tomorrow. I said, can I pray over you? And I, in Jesus in the Bible, he puts his finger in somebody's ear, you know, so I did that. Just trying to be all biblical, you know, feel the wax. <laughs> I'm kidding about the wax. <laughs> I pray, and then I bump in, oh yeah, I didn't need to have surgery. God healed me. Never see this person in church. I go over to the house, they got Buddhas, you know, <laughs> on, the, on the floor. I'm like, wow, man, you got testimonies of God stepping in and healing you, and yet doesn't move you towards Jesus whatsoever. But what's wild is how much Jesus cares for this person anyways, how much Jesus cares for everybody. In Ezekiel 18, he says, all souls are mine. Okay? And you realize God loves everybody. That person you don't like, God actually does. And so that should change your way of thinking. And so it's kind of fun. The king goes, who's the traitor in my group? And, you know, hey, Elisha tells the king of Israel what you talk about in your bedroom. And you go, yikes, because remember that God knows all your thoughts before you think them? Yeah. That'll change your way of thinking, huh? Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. It's supposed to. What happens to me is I catch it in mid-thought, and I go, wait a minute wrong way to go here whoops sorry god you know and i just redirect it and you can stop that wrong thought early you can catch it late but when you catch it redirect it and he already knew you were inclined to think wrong that's why he went to the cross okay so i just want you to hear that i just want you to know that and so this king says well let me find out where elisha is I'm going to go stop him from interfering with my plans to invade, subjugate, and dominate, and humiliate the Israelites. Okay, and so they say that Elisha's in Dotham. He goes to Dotham. And by the way, Dotham was the place where Joseph had been sold by his brothers into slavery. Okay, remember that story back in Genesis? Can't help but think there's a correlation Somebody wants to subjugate the Israelites, and God's going back to that place where, uh, you know, somebody got sold into slavery and is saying, let's, let's change the dynamics here. Well, they come, the army surrounds the town, and, you know, Elisha's servant probably stretches out, going to go get the morning, you know, paper, and boom, there's an army surrounding the town. It's panic moments, right? And um, I, I don't know, sometimes those panic moments happen to us. You get up on a random Tuesday and there's bad news. Somebody's, you know, hijacked your, your bank account or maybe you got a relationship problem you didn't know you had. Maybe there's a career issue. There, maybe there's a health scare 
Uh, we all know those moments in life where things all of a sudden come to a screeching crisis halt. This is one of those moments. You know, between 1875 and 1883, there's a professional thief named, um, <clears throat> what was his name? Black Bart. Okay, do you remember him? Of course you don't. This was in 1883, all right? <laughs> and he... They made a movie about him. Okay, yeah, you saw the movie. All right. And so, um, you know, he stirred fear in everybody on the stagecoaches coming across to the West, you know, and I think he robbed 29 different stagecoach crews. And, you know, he was so feared he didn't even have to fire a shot, all right? He, he had a hood over his face. Nobody ever saw him. No one could ever track his trail. And, and so he was this intimidating guy that paralyzed the West in fear. And kind of sounds like some of the fears that we face. Have you ever noticed how they can paralyze you? You know, I got a best friend right now in the hospital, you know, and they don't know what's wrong with him. And that's frightening when you don't know what's wrong. Because, you know, well, I think I got a problem here. Well, no, it's probably this, and you go in and fix it. But when you don't know, your mind will take you to places that, you know, you know you're know, supposed to never go on the Internet when you have, to, when you have a, a pain in your side. Because, you know, for sure you're going to come up with a fatal diagnosis that's about to happen in three days, right? And so it's best just to go to the doctor and let him help you live a little bit longer. Um, you know, this, this guy that puts fear in our lives, he shows up in hospitals and job interviews. He lures us into trading our integrity for popularity. He convinces us to keep silent when we should have said something. He, he whispers into our ears, no one really cares about you. This black bard of our soul, he steals our peace and joy in life. He robs us of our hope for tomorrow. The name of Black Bart, the way we know him, is fear and it's fear of death, fear of failure, fear of defeat, fear of rejection, fear of being alone, fear of God. And you go, well, I'm a Christian. I don't need to fear God. And now you will be shocked at how many people live in fear of God. You don't understand his grace for you. Yeah, but what about all these mistakes covered by the cross? When you are in fear of God, it disappoints him because you don't understand how much he loves you. Yeah, the Bible says those who fear the Lord are going to be blessed different kind of fear. This kind of fear is when you have an awe and respect and awareness of, his, uh, awareness of his grandeur and what he's made available to you and how much he loves you, okay? Um, that's the fear we're supposed to have, all right? Not, oh my gosh, he's going to crush me. Jesus was crushed for you. And that should change the way you fear death. F death is merely your soul moving to the next chapter of eternity. Fear of failure, failure is just a learning opportunity. Fear of defeat, um, with God at your side, any defeat can become a victory. Fear of rejection, you need to know that even though other, everybody else rejects you, you are loved by God. Okay, fear of being alone, you're never alone. So do you see how each fear you can take down if you want to take it before the Lord? Well. Satan knows that he can rattle us if he gets us to, to fear. Then we won't scale the peaks of life or the depths of our faith. I'm talking to this kid the other day, and I go, tell me about your dreams. Oh, I don't dream anymore. I've had too many setbacks. And I go, are you kidding me? You're 28 years old. I'm 60, and i got dreams. Don't give up on your dreams. Okay. So... Let's think about this text real quickly. Elisha's servant, he's focused on the Syrian army, okay. not the chariots of fire. Okay? And you have to know, the chariots that are surrounding the town, guess what? These are all throughout the Bible. Habakkuk 3.8, did you rage against the sea when you rode with your horses in your victorious chariots? Psalm 68.17, the chariots of God are tens of thousands of thousands. Okay? Um, God has his resources, all right? And, and Elisha's servants, he represents those who concentrate on the problem, not the problem solver, okay? And that is your challenge for the day. 
do you realize the spiritual resources that you have available to you? Somebody showed me a picture. This little girl, I don't know, I think she was three year old. She had this little phone and she was just taking pictures on the phone of what's going on in the room and what was going on in the room was the prayer meeting and one person had their Bible open and this angelic being was coming out of the Bible. Okay. It's happening while well, nobody's aware of it. Yeah. Some little girl happened to snap a picture and I guess they decided that the supernatural realm decided we'll let this one go through. And somebody else had a picture and there's this huge white column of something coming out of that Bible. Okay. And you're like, wow, there's a supernatural realm moving all around us. And if children have guardian angels, you know, we like to think, oh, children have them. You know, we probably need guardian angels more than the children do, right? And what I'm saying is God's moving for you. He's moving around you. He's got the chariots of fire ready to protect you, okay? The challenge, fix your eyes on Jesus as you go forward through every situation, okay? Um, I talked about God the Father this Sunday. You have a Father who loves you, who cares about you, who's interested in your life, who's involved. He knows your thoughts, and He can figure out where you're going, and He'll, he'll be able to guide you and redirect you and pick you up after you fall, and He cares about you, and you intentionally move away from Him. What an amazing God, okay? And, and I guess I want you to know, um, wherever you are, God is, and God is for you. And here's the difference. Elisha lived in the presence of God. I almost see the scenario as the servant goes out, he sees the problem, he comes running back in, and, you know, Elisha's just kicking back, having his morning prayer time, and what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Now, there's more with us than there are with him. And... God opened the eyes of my servant and then he sees all the vast spiritual resources around him. Okay? And I, I guess I want you to understand the vast spiritual resources around you. Don't you feel like this world's overwhelming me? This world's getting the best of me? This world's crushing me? Guess what? You got a God who's real and really cares about you and it has his eternal centuries surrounding you. And I want you to remember your identity as his child. If God is for us, who can be against us? All right? So take whatever your personal problem is right now and put God in the mix with you against that personal problem. Suddenly, you're going to be victorious. And this isn't because Elisha's an optimist. Okay, let's be positive here in this situation. No, no. He, the circumstances didn't change. It's the object of the vision changed. His vision was on God, not on the enemy, not on the cancer, not on the financial problem, not on the relational breakdown, okay? Not on the death of somebody we love. It, his eyes are on the Lord God. And that's why we need to practice the presence of God. And what does that mean? That means, you know how I'm always leaning on you? Read a chapter of the Bible a day. Have a prayer life. The prayer life is taking the time. Yesterday, I got a busy day, and so I, it's time to do my devotions, and it's Mark 15. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, read through this real fast so I can check the block. I did my devotions today. Well, Mark chapter 15 is when Jesus dies on the cross. So I'm in high super high drive and start to read the chapter and had to downshift to third, down to first gear, down to neutral, actually reverse down to reverse, go back, reread it slowly to receive what's going on as Jesus is going to the cross because what I'm reading right then and there is more important than anything I'm going to face all day long. I'm reading about when Jesus gave his life for you and me, okay? 
And sometimes we just have to make that space to hear from God, to slow down, to take notes, to write out your prayer, or just list the things that you want to lift, put before him. Okay, to take the time to interact, to practice the presence. And what you'll find is a five-minute touch with God won't be enough. You know, 15-minute touch, well, that's pretty good. But when you start to spend that half an hour with the Lord, you see a huge shift in the way you approach every day. And if you're willing to spend more time, you hear the voice of God. You have Him moving in and around you and through you and upon you. Okay? It's not the amount of time that's going to lead to, you know, I've noticed that an hour and ten minutes brings me this amount of spiritual... No, it's not like that. Sometimes it's a short prayer. Last week I was unprepared and somebody came in and they wanted healing for a fourth stage cancer. And I'm like, oh boy. And what was really cool is I realized this isn't going to be about me. And it's never about me anyways. But there's something about being ready for the moment, okay? Be ready in season and out of season. I was out of season and I wasn't ready. But I know that he's ready. And it was cool because I laid hands on this person and they said, man, I felt your hand heating up on me. And that's an indication for me that the Spirit of God was on the move, okay? And so, guess what? That's a moment when I wasn't ready. Other times, you know, I come out of the prayer closet who, who wants me? You know what I mean? Uh, what, what are we going to face today? What are we going to conquer today in the name of Jesus Christ? Who's going to come in my path that I can release the Lord onto? That's the kind of confidence we should have because that's the kind of God who's always with you. In your business, your health, your kids, whatever gets you, you've got God always for you. I'll tell you this wild story. Um, the, uh, the British were facing the Germans in World War I. And they were losing. And they're losing bad. And the, the, the battle has turned against them. And they're about to all get slaughtered. And so the general says, everybody, go to prayer. So the British stopped shooting. And they all went to prayer. Well, all of a sudden, somebody looks up. And there are... This is, this is history. This is not somebody's story, I'm telling you. There are beings, huge beings, with their backs towards the British, going towards the Germans, and all of a sudden the Germans stop firing and retreat immediately. And both sides of the Germans and the British talked about a supernatural moment when God intervened in that battle. And you're going, what happened? And somebody decided to pray. So do you see, again, the spiritual beings available to you? Do you see the power of prayer? Do you see what can happen? This is what I want you to know. God specializes in deliverance. And you can have confidence when you pray over people. It's an amazing realization. You don't know how he's going to do it. You don't know what he's going to do. But you know when you pray, God's been activated. And now you are supernaturally partnered with Almighty God. There's another fun story. These two missionaries in Africa, they go to the bank to get funds for their mission. And then they're walking home and they, it gets dark and they decide, well, why don't we sleep here on the hillside? And so they slept on the hillside, got up in the morning, and went home. Well, one of them runs into somebody else in town a few weeks later, and he goes, oh, I remember you. I know you. He goes, I don't know you. I've never met you before. He goes, oh, yeah, I met you. We saw you get money out of the bank, and we followed you to the hillside. And when you guys went to sleep, we were going to kill you and rob you. But you had all these military men around you pointing guns at us. And so we ran for our lives. He says, we don't have any military men. Yes, you did. <laughs> okay. The chariots of God surrounding his people. And I hope right now you're starting to feel the coverage that God has made available to you. I hope you start to realize that you're not going through this life alone, that you're not battling you know, your, whatever you're facing alone. 
And I, I love this passage. Elisha says, open the eyes of my servant and close the eyes of my enemies. So do you see what's happening here? Eyesight. And then let's finish off the story. What does is, what is, uh, he do with the, the army of the Israelites? Let's show the love of friendship to them. And they never came and attacked Israel again. So I want you to see the kind of movement you can have. You can get an enemy to stop coming after you. You can open up the eyes so that people can see the power and love of God. Okay? We fix our eyes on not what is seen, but is what is unseen. When you live in the supernatural realm, that's when you experience the supernatural realm. And I guess what God's inviting you to is an abnormal life. We don't live in the natural. We live in the supernatural. Okay? You, look, you belong to somebody who's looking out for you with unconditional, irrational, selfless, powerful, personal love. It's irrational. It's unconditional. But I didn't earn it. I, 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 I know. He just likes you. You have to deal with it. He just loves you, even though you sin. He just cares about you, even when you're not thinking about him. He's very personal to you. That's your God. All right? So where do we go with all this stuff? <clears throat> well, you have to make a decision, whether you believe it or not. Remember I was talking about um, Black Bart? Well... You need to know something about Black Bart. When they finally caught him and they took off his mask, okay, they didn't find a bloodthirsty bandit from Death Valley. They found a mild-mannered druggist from Decatur, Illinois. Okay, um, the papers had pictured him as some, you know, man storming the mountains on horseback, and really he was afraid of horses, and he always went to his robberies in a buggy. Okay, um, uh, Charles E. Bowles, the the black bandit. Bart, um, he never fired a shot because he never loaded his gun because he was afraid of guns, okay? And sometimes we're afraid of things that really can't hurt us. And when you belong to God, nothing can hurt you. Your life is father filtered. Yeah, well, what about these problems? In this world, you will have tribulations, but with him, he'll come alongside you. Why did you allow this? I've got a plan for your life. What are you doing with me now? Trust me and walk with me. Okay? It might not be that beautiful life where there's no pain, no hurt. You live in a mansion and you fly in your jet and, and, and you contribute nothing to humanity. Maybe he's got a different vision for you where you go through the trials of life so you have to depend on him and lean on him and develop a relationship with him and enjoy him and find him moving and real in your life. Wow. That's what he's hoping that you'll have with him. Well, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I'm a worrier. I hope you're not. This is how it happens in my house. Where's my bank card? Can't find my bank card. Oh, no. You know, somebody's got it and is depleting my bank account right now. And then they're going to be able to track my numbers to my house and they're going to come and rob me of all of my stuff and, and possibly kill me as well and oh my goodness and oh here it is here's the bank card <laughs> you know how much do we just immediately go into crisis mode instead of just going lord can you help me find my bank card all right and sometimes when you say lord will you help me it's a supernatural gets involved. We need to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Take every thought captive. I belong to Jesus. If God did not spare his own son, will he not freely give us all other things? Okay? And so I guess for you and me, we have to ask God to open up his heart for our eyes to see. Open up his resources for our eyes to see. Okay? Because our battle, it's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers of the dark age, spiritual hosts of wickedness. Okay? The battle that's coming up against you, it requires a supernatural army that's available 
to you. Okay? And I want to say this one more time. Your Christian walk is supposed to be supernatural. Yes. All right? Well... In today's fast-moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones, and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then, send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Give Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer.